This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Chemistry or Combined Science, looking at the fourth topic, chemical changes. This video is a list of questions based on key facts you need to be able to recall from the chemistry specification. You can download the questions from the description below and use these to make flashcards or to test yourself and then check your answers using the video. Once you're happy that you can recall all of the key facts listed in the specification, you'll be able to move on to more challenging questions that ask you to apply your knowledge. Metals react with oxygen to form compounds called metal oxides. So for instance, copper oxide or tin oxide. These are examples of bases, chemicals that can neutralize acids. This reaction is called oxidation because the metal is gaining oxygen. The reactivity of a metal is determined by how easily it can lose its outer shell electrons to form a positive ion. When those metals are put in order of reactivity, firstly we see the alkali metals, potassium and then sodium and then lithium, arranged in order from largest to smallest. Then the group two metals, calcium and magnesium, again largest to smallest. And then these transition metals go in the order zinc, iron, then copper. We can place the metals in this order of reactivity by observing their reactions with water and with dilute acids. The more vigorously the metal reacts, so for instance the more bubbles are produced, the more reactive it is. We can place hydrogen and carbon in this reactivity series in order to tell us about whether metals will react with acids and also whether they can be extracted by reduction with carbon. Carbon fits in directly before zinc and then hydrogen fits in directly before copper. When reacting with water, the alkali metals, potassium, sodium and lithium, all react quite vigorously. They produce a lot of bubbles of hydrogen gas. Calcium and magnesium will produce small amounts of fizzing, so you can definitely see the reaction, but it's far less impressive. Zinc and iron react very, very slowly indeed. You'll barely be able to see this in real time, and copper won't react at all. When we react the metals with acid, the reactions are more vigorous than they are with water. So now the alkali metals are violent and explosive. The group two metals have a really quite vigorous reaction. Zinc and iron, you can see fizzing, and copper still does not react. Your specification lists gold as an example of an unreactive metal, although other acceptable answers would be silver and platinum. Unreactive metals tend to be found native in the Earth's crust, which means they're found as unreactive elements, not part of compounds. Most metals are found in ores. These are rocks that contain enough of a metal compound to make it financially viable to extract it, and this requires chemical reactions such as reduction with carbon. The metals that can be extracted by reduction with carbon are those that are less reactive than carbon, so for instance zinc and iron and copper. Reduction in this instance means the removal of oxygen. Displacement means a chemical reaction where a more reactive element takes the place of a less reactive element in a compound. If you're taking the higher tier papers, then you also need some alternative definitions for oxidation and reduction. And these are the ones that you're going to continue to use in A-level chemistry. So oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. And a redox reaction is a chemical reaction where both of those processes take place at the same time. The simple equation for the displacement of zinc from zinc chloride by magnesium will be this. And to turn that into an ionic equation, we need to remove the spectator ions. So firstly, we split apart the compounds into the individual ions. So zinc chloride becomes zinc ions and chloride ions, and magnesium chloride becomes magnesium ions and chloride ions. And then the chloride ions are the same on both sides of the equation. So they cancel each other out. So we just take those out. And that gives us a final ionic equation of Zn2 plus plus Mg reacts to form Mg2 plus plus Zn. The half equation for the oxidation of magnesium will show magnesium losing electrons to form Mg2 plus ions, so we have Mg reacts to form Mg2 plus plus 2e minus. You can check that this is right because the charges balance on both sides of the equation. When a metal reacts with an acid, it produces a salt and hydrogen, and you can remember this using the acronym MASH. You can show that this is hydrogen by igniting the gas, which will burn rapidly with a squeaky pop sound. Definitely hydrogen. When hydrochloric acid forms salts, these are chloride salts or metal chlorides. Sulfuric acid produces sulfate salts or metal sulfates, and nitric acid produces nitrate salts or metal nitrates. 
A base is a chemical that can neutralise an acid, such as a metal oxide or a metal carbonate. An alkali is a soluble base, such as a metal hydroxide. When acids react with alkalis or with metal oxides, they make a salt and water. When acids react with metal carbonates, they make a salt, water and carbon dioxide. To prove that a gas is carbon dioxide, you can bubble it through lime water, which will turn cloudy. When carrying out the required practical, the acid is heated in order to increase the rate of reaction. Excess base is added to the acid because one of the two reactants must be in excess, and it's much easier to remove excess base than excess acid. So the excess base is added in order to ensure that all of the acid reacts because it has become the limiting reactant. The excess base is then removed by filtration. The pure dry soluble salt is extracted from the salt solution by crystallization. This involves putting the solution into an evaporating basin and heating it using a hot water bath or a Bunsen burner. In GCSE chemistry, an acid is a substance that dissolves in water to release hydrogen ions, whereas an alkali is a substance that dissolves in water to release hydroxide ions. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14, where numbers below 7 are acids, numbers above 7 are alkalis, and 7 is the neutral point. The universal indicator is red in acids, green in neutral solutions, and blue in alkalis. During a neutralisation reaction between an acid and an alkali, the hydrogen ions react with the hydroxide ions to make water. This can be represented by the ionic equation H plus plus OH minus reacts to form H2O. In order to measure volumes during a titration, you need a volumetric pipette and a burette. An indicator is used in order to make the end point of the reaction visible when the colour changes. Phenolphthalein is colourless in acids and dark pink in alkalis. A white tile is used in titration to make the colour change visible, and a conical flask is used to prevent the um, solution from splashing out as you're swirling. It's important to swirl in order to homogenise the reaction mixture, and the end point of the titration is the point where you see the first permanent colour change. A strong acid completely ionises in water to release hydrogen ions when it dissolves. Strong acids include nitric acid, sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, and you should know the chemical symbols for each of these. A weak acid dissolves in water and releases hydrogen ions, but does not completely ionise. Weak acids include carbonic acid, citric acid and carboxylic acids like ethanoic acid. When you look at a strong acid and a weak acid at the same concentration, the strong acid will have a lower pH because it releases more hydrogen ions. One point on the pH scale is equivalent to an increase in 10 times of hydrogen ions. So for instance, pH 2 has a thousand times more hydrogen ions than pH 5 because from going from 2 to 5, that's 3 points on the pH scale and 10 to the power of 3 is a thousand. Electrolysis is the process of splitting apart compounds into their elements using electricity, and it can be carried out on ionic compounds, provided that they are either molten or aqueous, in other words, dissolved. The substance needs to be molten or aqueous because this allows the ions to move. If it's a solid ionic compound, then although there are charged particles, they're held in place by that strong electrostatic force of attraction. The electrodes are the inert conducting rods which supply the current to the electrolyte. In electrolysis, the positive electrode is the anode and the negative electrode is the cathode. The positive ion is the cation and the negative ion is the anion. Discharge is the process of charged particles stopping being charged and becoming neutral again. This happens when an ion gains or loses electrons and stops being charged. The positive ions during electrolysis will move to the negative electrode because opposites attract. There, they will gain electrons, in other words, they will be reduced, and they will turn back into neutral atoms. The negative ions will move to the positive electrode because opposites attract. They will lose electrons to become uncharged atoms. Any metal can be extracted by electrolysis, but since it's so expensive, we tend to use it in three scenarios. The first one is where we're extracting a very reactive metal, which can't be extracted using reduction with carbon, because if it's more reactive than carbon, the carbon won't be able to displace it from the ore. 
The second situation is where that particular metal reacts with carbon to form compounds. So again, we wouldn't be able to use reduction with carbon. The third situation is where we want a very pure metal extracted. So for instance, the copper that's used in electrical wiring needs to be extremely high purity because the higher the purity, the higher the electrical conductivity. Electrolysis is really expensive because you have to pay for the energy to melt the electrolyte, the electricity to run the electrolysis, and also you have to pay for electrodes when they wear away. In the extraction of aluminium from aluminium oxide, cryolite is added to disrupt the ionic lattice and therefore allow it to melt at a lower temperature, saving energy and money. In the electrolysis of solutions, there will be four ions. Two come from the salt, and then there are also hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions from the water. At the positive electrode, the negative ions will be discharged. If a halide ion is present, so chloride, bromide, fluoride, then this will be discharged and you'll make halogen. Otherwise, hydroxide ions are discharged to make oxygen. At the negative electrode, the positive ions will be um, discharged. So either you'll produce a very unreactive metal, what I think of as jewellery metal, so gold, silver, copper, or you'll produce hydrogen gas. If you're sitting higher tier, then you need to be able to write half equations for any of these processes. The first of these processes would be the reduction of a metal cation. So in this instance, we've picked magnesium as an example, and because magnesium has a two plus charge, it needs to gain two electrons. Your second example is the reduction of hydrogen ions. So again, we can look at this and say that a hydrogen ion has a single positive charge, so that would need one electron, but we know that hydrogen goes round as a divalent molecule. So we're going to need two hydrogen ions to make that molecule and therefore two electrons. The discharge of an oxide ion will involve the loss of two electrons from each ion, and oxygen again goes around as a divalent molecule. So we'll need two oxide ions to make that molecule and therefore we'll see the loss of four electrons. Finally, for solutions, you need to be able to write a discharge equation for hydroxide ions and four hydroxide ions will turn into two water molecules, an oxygen molecule and four electrons. That's it for recall questions for unit four of AQA GCSE chemistry. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this useful in your revision for your GCSE exams. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe below for more GCSE chemistry content coming soon.